Okay, so let's uh, start. Our next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Cherise von Xiland from the Humboldt Universität zu Berlin. Uh, Cherise uh, has taught philosophy at the Technical University in Darmstadt and held the Rudolf Arnheim Visiting Professorship of the Department of Art and Visual History at the Humboldt University in Berlin before joining the Techno Science Studies Group at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Sciences at the BTU Kotzburg, uh, Cottbus Zemtenburg. The central focus of her transdisciplinary research interests is Immanuel Kant, his global reception and the role of enlightenment thought in contemporary digital practice. As a philosopher of the internet, she seeks to grasp the transformation of culture and society by the digital media and infrastructures. And the title of her presentation is a Skeuomorphic Selfhood, a Kantian Take on the Avatar. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your introduction. And thank you to Andrea and the Institute for bringing us together for this absolutely riveting discussion. Thank you for your stamina, for returning for the last session of the day. And I want to preface my remarks by saying that I absolutely refuse to believe what Andrea claimed this morning, that he put no thought into the composition of the sequence of the papers, that this was just a random um, effect. In uh, listening to the papers build up to the comments that I would like to make, there's been an absolutely extraordinary number of uh, coincidences and compatibilities. I just want to recall for you um, the discussion we had this morning about egocentric, allocentric, and heterocentric perception in uh, brain physiology. The talk we heard by Dominique on human and machine hybrids and how these are performed through avatars. You will see that I visit some of the same material uh, and use it for a very different argument. And finally, the quotation that we had at the beginning of the talk on Sardinian um, figures and fakes by Primo Levi, the idea that there is nothing new under the sun, that there's nothing that humans can make that can compete with the artifice and design of nature. Um, I, um, this is an archeo archeological um, claim, um, very forcefully presented, and archeology span will also be the crux of the comments that I will be presenting to you now and the examples that I wish to show. Skeuomorphic selfhood, a Kantian take on the avatar. This subtitle could also be a Kantian critique of the concept of self as represented by the avatar. A concept some would say that Kant's own philosophy most forcefully put forward. As you may have heard in the news recently, the Kant statue in Kaliningrad was defiled. This vandalism occurred in the context of the city seeking a name for its newly built airport. Kaliningrad used to be Königsberg, the town where Kant lived and taught. Although East Prussia fell to the Russians in the Second World War, its new inhabitants seemed to love their German patron saint. Asked to submit names, they opted for Emanuel Kant Airport, even though the instructions specified that only historical Russian actors would be considered for the naming. The measure of choice, sorry, since the German was the front runner, an expedient damper was needed. The measure of choice, hot pink paint, gives the nationalist hostility a derogatory gendered touch. I invite you to recall this image when my closing comments turn to Alan Turing's imitation game. Kant seems to have a growing number of detractors these days. He's rejected for what appear to be appalling sexual politics and xenophobic utterances in his rhetoric. He's dismissed for having promoted an idealized vision of a free and autonomous human subject 
that does not hold up to scrutiny, can be associated with free market ideology, and whose a time appears to be up. He is pegged as the cardinal philosophy of the age of print capital, to speak with British historian Benedict Anderson, as channeled through the German media theorist Friedrich Kittler. And this would seem to imply a set of epistemological premises that no longer apply in the age of cyber capitalism. Kittler is famous for the argument that philosophers uh, epistemologically draw on the technologies um, of communication in their age. And so with the passing of print media, uh, Kant has basically uh, become obsolete in the new environment of digital communications. It doesn't improve Kant's standing in progressive circles that Frauke Petri, former speaker of the Alternative für Deutschland party, strove to call her party political foundation the Immanuel Kant Stiftung. Nor does Putin's avowal of Kant import heightened uh, import heighten the latter's popularity with the critically minded. Kant can be seen as a dead, white, old male whose writings are touted to be all but incomprehensible to the untrained reader. No need to beat around the bush. Kant can be a hard sell in the contemporary climate of opinion. The paper I will be presenting today is part of a larger project to popularize Kant, something he keenly promoted himself by showing his thought to be of pressing relevance to the digital age. In addition to his ideas still having currency, I would argue that they are coming into their own in ways that were mostly overlooked until the rise of the personal computer and untold portable smart devices. Kant's essay, What is Enlightenment, from 1783 one of his most famous texts, certainly the most widely received. This paper appeared in the Berlinische Monatsschrift, and it was part of a series of publications which also included the article you see um, on the right, which was a discussion of von Kempelen's Mechanical Turk. The referent of that piece was, as we've already heard, an automaton traveling the courts of Europe. And the Mechanical Turk, um, or rather, um, the puppet master of the Mechanical Turk insisted that the machine's strategizing was intrinsic to the ingenious mechanism, that there was no human operator involved. Now, the spectators. Uh, fell into two parties. There were those who were completely awed by this uh, engineering feat, and there were those who insisted that they didn't know how it was done, but there had to be a human operator hidden within this device. Now, the interesting thing about reading Kant's essay in the context of this discussion is that he intervenes specifically in this debate. What is enlightenment? is an answer to the question of how to interpret the Mechanical Turk. And what Kant argues is that the debate is premised on the wrong paradigm of cognition, that the debate focuses on the idea of a personified subject that is this automaton, that is like a human individuated subject. But actually, the process of reason is distributive, relational, processual, institutional. So the category of thinking reason in the figure of the mechanical Turk is simply the wrong category, and it's irrelevant if there's a human operator or not. In fact, Kant will say this is a very welcome fake because it is an object lesson for us to think about and readjust the model of reason that we, um, from which we understand the process of progressive enlightened cultural development. With this idea, Kant is very um, 
forward thinking. He's very modern with this idea. The mechanical Turk has become the logo for this online marketplace of crowdsourced services in which a distributive collective army of employees come together and execute human intelligent tasks, which are um, decisions of judgment and discernment that machines aren't able to execute and that are therefore delegated to this anonymous, uh, non-centralized, non-personified um, collective intelligence. So this is a specific example of the um, contemporary relevance um, in Kant's thought, why he might apply well to an age of digital technologies. Uh, there is in the Enlightenment discussions that he is participating in already a very clear uh, statement of the possibility of artificial intelligence. It comes in the context of this automaton. And that prospect raises questions that continue to haunt our contemporary cultural discussions. There is another reason why um, Kantian thinking has a um, particular, um, poses an interesting contrast to reason the way we've been discussing it today as exemplified and extended in the figuration of the avatar. Kant, on the one hand, formulates very complex arguments about pure reason understood from the perspective of, the, of transcendental subjectivity. Towards the end of his career, he writes an anthropology in which he's concerned to think about the actualization of experience of human reason in uh, sort of real historical embodied experience. And a very important term that he introduces in the sequence of the critical philosophy and finally culminating in the anthropology is the idea of Gemüt. And with Gemüt, he does a number of things. This idea of Gemüt uh, in, inserts into the language uh, a new vocabulary for mind. It is not soul, it is not uh, spirit, but it's gemut. It's a term with which he basically tries to popularize his own philosophy. He creates a term that can be used in lay people's terms. Now, it would sort of take my entire time to try to pack the whole Kantian project into this one word. So I've just brought to you, um, on the bottom, you see the plaque of his grave, a met metal plaque with like a central quotation from his philosophy. And above is that quotation in, um, um, in the German formulation. In the in English formulation, it says, two things fill the gemüt with ever new and increasing admiration and awe the more often and steadily we reflect upon them. The starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. So you can see gemüt is distinct from me, from self, from any kind of individuated personhood. And it is somehow coextensive with celestial mechanics and with eternal laws of justice. There is something um, law-governed about this idea. Um, here we have the Russian plaque on the gravestone. We have an American advertising campaign by the Container Corporation of America, a, a box founding company that also uses Kant to promote um, their 
uh, sort of um, business model, and the German formulation. So these are just sort of the way this idea has spread and been popularized and integrated into different cultural environments. Now the problem with Gemüt in translation is that this word was not introduced uh, in English. And in fact, when Kant is translated, Gemüt is just translated into any number of words that at that point in the argument uh, do some of the work that this cohesive concept is doing in Kant. So soul, mind, sentient mind, psyche, sensibility, feelings, temper, mood, disposition, nature, feeling, intellect, and on and on and on. So the word just kind of fragments into numerous concepts and dissolves uh, in translation. Another reason why this idea of gemüt might ring some bells is that it is the etymological core of one of the absolute cliches of German cultural um, folkloric practice, namely the idea of gemütlichkeit, which you may have heard of. Gemütlichkeit is a form of social gathering associated with the beer garden, with the um, garden colony, with the Christmas market. These are all places where you might experience Gemütlichkeit. Gemütlichkeit is obviously a social practice. If we go back to Kant and look at how he introduces the idea of Gemüt as a way of thinking of reason, he p posits reason as a form of social practice. The way that Gemüt is a sort of learnt and acquired by humans is through social interactions and they internalize this idea of gemüt. So it is a social practice that is iterative upon a social practice. What you will also see in these pictures is that the idea of gemütlichkeit involves a collective social body that consists of a number of um, particular hubs of small sociability within a broad sociability. Each one of these examples has exactly that form. This is critical for understanding how this idea of a processual reason is organized. That is a quick sort of rough and ready Kant for today's purposes. I now want to go to an avatar, avatar and an avatar debate that I found very interesting in 2006. It involved Neu Altenburg, which is a German community which uh, was created in Second Life. And it replicates these ideas of a German Gemütlichkeit, of a particular cultural social practice that comes, that kind of spawns its own mentality. The avatar was, who was the author of this environment, was called Ulrika Zugzwang, a chess move. Zugzwang means you're forced to make the next move in the game. She is celebrating this community that she's founding at an Oktoberfest, opened for the um, event, and a Bierstein that she has coded as well. Neu Altenburg is uh, a town of split timber housing, the architecture that evokes specifically this very German kind of um, togetherness and sense of community. With this community come values that are collectivist values that have to do with the redistribution of resources with um, sort of social um, responsibilities, with uh, paying taxes and um, kind of um, communal forms of protection. She wants to make Neu Altenburg a piece of second life where you necessarily sign on for this kind of communal participation. She's doing this in a world of avatars who, by definition, represent a very different kind of cultural 
uh, socioeconomic imaginary. And the result is that the director of Linden Labs suggests that if she's going to sort of come with these experiments of self-governance and second life, maybe she just wants to um, run for president. And she takes him up on this offer. This is her campaign to run for president uh, within the second life world. And then she is going to bring with her this different social kind of organization. This raises contradictions between perceiving of autonomous human agency in the form of an individuated human subject as an avatar or in the world, and what it means to think of communal, distributive, um, collective forms of experience. So now to the main term of this uh, paper, the idea of skeuomorphic selfhood. I say selfhood as opposed to self because the, um, the, the question is to think about what kind of uh, epistemological status can we accord to the self uh, in the experiments that we're, we were hearing about this morning, the self is a necessary premise of the variables that are um, being examined in, the, um, in a controlled environment. And um, so I'll, I'll, I'll develop the examples and then uh, we can think about uh, how does this idea of the self uh, shift if we think of it in terms of the meaning of skeuomorphism. Skeuomorphism is a term that comes from interface design. It hit the, um, it hit um, sort of the headlines uh, in the context of uh, debates within the tech community, a design battle that's tearing Apple and the tech world apart. Skeuomorphism is the creation of an online aesthetic that evokes material um, and aesthetic qualities of tools from the analog world, and they are transferred into the visual um, presentation of the graphical user interface. This idea of skeuomorphism was introduced by Henry Colley March in an article from the Lancashire Archaeological Society in 1889. And I will go to the quotes that I hope you probably can't read them. But what March notices is that there are forms, um, the, there are different forms of art ornament and they require different names. The ornaments, um, if the ornaments that are taken from animals are called zoomorphs. The ornaments that are taken from plants are called phylomorphs. And March notices that it will be convenient to um, call those um, morphological ornamental repetitions that are derived from stru structure, that are derived from human practice, from human technology and techniques, the echoes of those techniques to call those skeuomorphs, skeuomorph from tackle, vessel, equipment, dress. And then he says something very interesting about why he is introducing this term. As soon as man began to make things, to fasten a handle to a stone implement, to construct a wattled roof, to weave a mat, skeuomorphs became an inseparable part of his existence. They grew, as it were, 
with the growth of his brain and ultimately occasioned a mental craving or expectancy. This idea that the skeuomorph grows with the human brain, that there is a model of cognition that is, has its own evolutionary developmental logic, and we don't simply derive it from animals or from uh, plants that are observed in our environment. We derive it through iterative referral to the techniques that have succeeded in building an environment for ourselves in the past. That is the skeuomorph. So then attached to the article are these panels where he shows the way in which the zoomorph and the phylomorph um, uh, sort of basically converge towards this skeuomorphic uh, natural history of the ornament. And the difference between the two is that in the zoomorph, in the ornaments that we learn from animal life, basically the ornament replaces and annihilates the animal. And those that we learn from plant life m sort of forge a merger and are combined and easily compatible with the forms of plant life. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Now, I would like to step back to the moment in which the formal definition of the computer is introduced in 1936 by Alan Turing with the definition of the universal Turing machine. Something I can't go into today, um, the Turing machine is in fact an answer to the problem raised by the mathematician David Hilbert of the Entscheidungsproblem, a problem in formal mathematics. David Hilbert is a mathematician who also comes uh, from Königsberg. This idea of the Entscheidungsproblem and the way that Hilbert's mathematics works out this problem is deeply rooted in a Kantian tradition of philosophical mathematics associated with the Königsberg School of Mathematics. The, introduce, the introduction of the universal Turing machine allows for the creation of the first computers of these very complex mainframes that then begin to be built from the 40s to the 70s, which are machines that can only be operated by skilled, trained specialists. This is a very different kind of apparatus than the one that will um, transform our life world with digital infrastructures that are maintained by mass-produced um, um, portable handheld computing devices. In order to make the transition from that complex Turing formulated uh, machine to the portable handheld devices, something needs to happen that both Steve Jobs and Bill Gates are very aware of and they're directly competing for. There has to be a user interface attached to this complex technology. And that user interface, that graphical user interface, um, what does that graphical user interface do? It anthropomorphizes these machines. It gives them an interactive capacity so that users can intuitively work with and navigate and operate them. This idea of a graphical user interface is not something that is invented at the time in which this problem is identified. The graphical user interface was already readily available. It was introduced by, um, it was fully formulated, it was, he's not sort of the sole author of this idea, but he's somebody who codified and expressed it very well, Otto Bettmann, who 
founds the first commercial picture library in Germany. He's closely associated with the members of the Bauhaus, um, Moholinage, Herbert Bayer. Um, he's in uh, close collaboration with them. And he wants to found this picture library in Berlin in 1936, uh, the same year when Alan Turing publishes um, the um, answer to the Entscheidungsproblem. Why is this graphical, or first let me present to you how this graphical interface um, is portrayed. So the whole archive is pressed into this portable Batman archive. So it's already the portable version of a real world institution. And the pages of this archive show you the way in which pictures devise their own orientational uh, semiotics. Here we have a graphic presentation of windows, indexes, menus, and pointers. We have the full articulation of the core metaphors of the desktop uh, user interface. On another page, he, uh, Otto Bettmann, uh, um, extends the semiotics, the logic of orientation, not just to visual cues, but to auditory cues. So the idea of an audiovisual environment in which we are interacting with densely information-rich environments is fully uh, manifested and anticipated in this catalog. The reason this is relevant in 1936 is because the world has already become so complex in process of, of modernization, of urbanization, that actually visual orientation in the modern environment is already something that has to be resolved. So here is an on, analog version of the graphical user interface that then uh, migrates to the machines that make our machines um, into the portable uh, ubiquitous devices. Bettman writes, Many books, uh, he, his books are sort of arguments of human history carried entirely visually through pictorial uh, representation. And in his Bettman Picture History of the World, he concludes the picture history of the world with this image, with the question, how does the caveman gradually evolve into the astronaut? Now with this image, we're much closer to the debates we've been having about the avatar. This is personification of human development based on individuated uh, embodied experience. But the graphical user interface is also anthropomorphism, but it's anthropomorphism that is not personified. It is an anthropomorphism in this logic of the skeuomorphism. It is a repetition of human artifice, of human design, that presents itself as a collective logic of reference and recognition of series and repetition, but it is not personified. And in this sense, the graphical user interface, which gives a human face that is not individuated to the computer, is very close to the kind of cognitive paradigm that Kant has in mind when he introduces the idea of gemüt as something that is a communitarian collective instantiation of an emergent distributive rational process. So this is just to end and allow us to transition to the uh, conversation, um, a computer animation of Homo sapiens where the skull is presented as something that looks very much as a piece of the world, the globe in the skull. And this idea, this merging of milieu 
with personification. The, um, the um, separation of a mammalian procreation of human genealogy from the idea of a cognitive procreation that has its own um, logic of sustained development referral in which the skeuomorph is the general representation of how tools are internalized. And in fact, the self is an internalized tool. And it is an antiquated, conventional, internalized tool. And the anthropomorph, meaning the figuration of human as self, the way in which the avatar accentuates that figuration, is just one version of this skeuomorphism, which can take a much broader distributive form. And perhaps as we become increasingly hybridized with the technologies, the digital technologies in our environment, this avatar is strangely anachronistic to the conditions of contextualized reason that we are actually grounded in um, and that our capacity for intelligent activity actually depends upon. Thank you very much. Just a tiny anecdote before we move to the discussion. The um, standard French translation of Gemut is cœur, heart, to give an idea of how difficult it is to translate it.